when something is going to happen, things start to align before. The one and only Gira Sarabhai chose to breathe her last a few days ago for more than five decades coming to Ahmedabad meant visiting her. This time too, by chance, I was in the city, but only to become a part of her last journey. Her hearse was being carried out of her home at the retreat in Shahibagh when I arrived to say a silent goodbye. I remember my first meeting with Gira at her studio, reconfigured in an old swimming pool in what now constitutes the incredible Calico Museum of Textiles. She walked me under a shaded pathway to a home right here in 1968. My fingers ran over the burnt wood. All the walls were paneled with this wood in her room. As she had a roof slide open, a perched peacock took flight and green tea arrived. Today, her mortal remains were on their way to her legendary farmhouse in Hasol, where she was to be cremated. Over to Hasol. After our first meeting, decades ago, Gira took me to see her masterpiece architectural creation set on a still tentative mud bank of the Sabarmati. I feel this is where independent India's unique design story acquired an edge. One has had the privilege of staying in Hasol over days, learning by experiencing what must indeed manifest the essence of a modern nation. Sitting on this swing with Gira during many twilight hours was like her gentle revelations, always returning to the same point, even as all around us the lights and the shadows kept shifting. Design for change or change by design? In fact, we still grapple with the term design, while the word doesn't appear in any Indian language. We try to discover what is talismanic to India or what comes close to its diverse spirit, living in so many centuries all rolled into one. For me, it has always been Gira's intrinsic and uncompromised act of remaining authentic. Her real and rooted self were always eager to find the most contemporary metaphors worthy of becoming old. Amongst the few of her time-honored but unmatched signatures, at one end, resilient mud plastered, lipied by local women, bitumenized, layered with marks of the hand, painted over by Jagdamba Devi of Mithila in the mid-sixties, post the Bihar famine. At the other end, there is a Darshan skyscraper in Mumbai and a brother of Vikram Sarabhai's home in Usmanpura with resonances of rights falling waters. One chatai covered room in Hassel's adobe wonderland was discreetly air-conditioned. Contradiction? Not quite, but quite defiant. Working with her formidable brother Gautam Bhai, she would negotiate paradoxes, bridge polarities, whether it be putting together an unprecedented repository of traditional textile skills or printing a crepe sari, silk screened with designs derived 
from the mushrooms in her collection. Both worked together to devise the brick walls for NID and renew an itinerant steel frame of a geodesic pavilion for calico mills. She could improvise smart exhibit mechanisms and surprise the likes of Charles Eames with simple indigenous solutions like filling heavy sands in sacks made of chintz as counterweights to prop display panels. Gira would alarm conventional conservationists with her unbounded, no-nonsense but uncommon approach to museum sonography. She selected what must be kept in the sturdier family mansion, completed by Surindranath Kaur in the 20s, 1920s, and what would be displayed as the finest of visible storage in the reconstituted outhouse, which is where the swimming pool was, as a neighborhood of uh, perfect proportions and balance. Abandoned fragments of old Havelis were made whole with the patience and intuition of a master builder. The last of Vastukar's Prabhudas Mistri once defined her as an unwritten Shastra, spoken slowly and surely. Carved wood panels returned to their context as one becomes aware of a reconstituted temple on the top floor of a family's handsome and rambling mansion. A classical bronze gallery reincarted with the silence of a South Indian Garbhagrah becomes resonant with the spiritual positioning. And nothing was not possible if Gira set her mind to it. Her cost-conscious regimentation in anything she did could include measuring the salary of her gardeners with the kilos of jasmine or roses they harvested, or distributing documents and printing whole books on Xerox machines long before desktop publishing became ubiquitous. Beauty and function, design and continuity, inspiration and rationale, target pursuit or stubbornness, clarity of vision or improvised jugar. Whatever one did required focused implementation. And of course, like Eames, she always said, everything connects. When you pull a thread, the whole textile moves, deconstructing a weave of making Bueller's Eckert treaties more accessible, required agile cross-indexing, and a strong sense of narrative instruction. Being transdisciplinary was second nature. Gira's sister Gita Ben became a hamsafar, documenting Gujarati popular theatre, music, dance. Gira would switch to speaking Gujarati with me and read out whole poems expecting me to understand the warp and weft of language and imagery. The ease of her thought process and the need to be heard by an ear that she could trust required familiarity. And I think Gujarat became her means to understand the world. What Gira's evolved learning shows that this new animal called design was all about making informed choices or building a context and reconstructing an intangible legacy into a whole. Look at this banyan tree. She found uprooted on a roadside. Gira had it transported slice by slice, reassembled and endowed 
with a sacred presence by ritually tying hand-spun threads around its trunk. The sutra became an alphabet of signage to introduce the story of textiles about to be told as never before. As she walked me towards the museum, through an undergrowth of a littered with autocrathonous relics, pottery, votives, a worldly tribal hut, she chose not to rest or to set the stage or offer a prologue. I thought she was taking a shortcut to the entrance of the now refurbished museum in the family house. No words were shared during a powerful introduction to a great new institution. But I became alive to a conscious design osmosis, turning memory into an experience, then into emotion that informed the mind. The no-nonsense Gira never indulged anyone. She would listen to my chance encounters, barely ever gossiped, and only once agreed to let me film her on an extended session that lasted three days. She didn't like me using my phone in her presence, so I hesitate to pull it out now and share what I found by chance. This post on WhatsApp says more for now. I've taken unusual liberty of choosing passages and excerpting a poem by David White. It could easily have been written for my venerable guru and friend, Gira. It's titled, What I Must Tell Myself. I know this house and this horizon, and this world I have made. I know this silence and the particular treasures and terrors of the way. I try to belong to my work, my loved ones, and my life. I have only this breath and this presence for my wings, and they carry me in my body. Whatever I do from one hushed moment to another, when one thing dies, all things die together and must live again in a different way. When one thing is missing, everything is missing and must be found again in a new whole. And everything wants to be complete. Everything wants to go home. And the geese traveling south are like the shadow of my breath, flying into the darkness on a great heartbeats to the unknown land where I belong. This morning, above the house, they have found me again, strangely full of faith, like a blind child, nestled in the feathers, following a great coast to the home I cannot see. Here I was cremated on a metal arthi-like palanquin, uniquely designed for mobility and reuse. A fragile frame was kept on a minimum amount of wood. The pyre allowed air to pass for a very quick and a very robust fire. Next day, the ashes gathered below, mixed with rose petals, were collected and scattered in the carries of the roses nearby.